Well, whew, I was just upstairs and lost track of time, but uh, we are going to be talking about Rust, the programming language today, and really um, kind of giving you a good feel for when you could evaluate to use Rust in your own projects and what you would use Rust for. Um, so our, our format for this talk is a brief history in Rust. What is Rust? Kind of an example of the language and, and what it can do. Um, the strengths of Rust so that you kind of get a feel for like how this language could play in, in your toolbox. And then really just a couple of good examples of people that have used Rust, what it's for, and, and if they, you know, how they worked out for the people. If you guys have any sort of questions while I'm talking, because I tend to, you know, I tend to like gloss over things or whatever, um, feel free to raise your hands and tell me that you don't understand what I'm saying or, or I'm being confusing, whatever, you know, just tell me, it's fine. Okay, so brief history of what Rust is. So it is a programming language that was designed by a guy named Graydon Hoare. Um, he was working for Mozilla at the time and it was a side project, uh, um, but it really kind of, uh, you know, started picking up inside of Mozilla internally. Um, he doesn't remember why it was named. He's guessing it was for a fungus, but, uh, you know, who knows? It might not have been a fungus. Oh, no. The link is broken. That's horrible. Um, but Mozilla came out and they officially sponsored it in 2009. Um, once they sponsored it, they uh, they wanted to start using it in their applications because one of the key selling points early on in the language was that it was a memory safe language and, and they needed that for browsers. Um, browsers have this problem where uh, they have to be really, really fast, but at the same time, if they have a memory leak or a memory problem, memory access problems, then you run into problems where you know people can do malicious things when you visit their web pages, and, and that's no good. So, so that's really kind of the reason and motivating factors, as far as I've read, um, on why it's on why Mozilla uses Rust. And back in two or 2012, that's when Rust went. 1.0. So the language itself is stable and they are making pretty strong guarantees that they're not going to break it or break existing code with it. <laughs> okay, so what is Rust? So it is a compiled language. It means it's not interpreted and it's not, not jitted or byte code. It's actually compiled to machine code. Uh, it's strongly static or strong static type, so it's none of this dynamic stuff that those dynamic queenies like. Now, you know, it's actually got strong types so that your compiler can tell you that you're, you're wrong when you do something bad. Um, the language has a lot of functional motivations to it, so they, they you know, they, they like the functional paradigms and so they expose a lot of them. Um, but it's also object-oriented, so uh, not traditionally object-oriented, but, but uh, um, it's, uh, sorry. Uh, I'm still like winded from running down the stairs and so it's a little bit like ah. um, so yeah it's not traditionally object oriented but it's based off of more composition and it really doesn't have strong support for inheritance so you know wins in my book and then it's unmanaged it doesn't actually have a garbage collector at, built into the language at all and so it runs kind of at the same level as C or C++ does so it is compiled, so that means that it's a small language. It also has a very small runtime associated with it. That means that when you compile a Rust application, you can expect it to be in kilobytes of size when it's done, and it has no additional requirements to run the application. Uh, they target C-level performance, and they get there by using the LLVM for, for their comp compilation. And so they, they, they can do almost everything that C can do, and they, they kind of say that it's a bug in the language if they're not on C-level performance. So we can see an example of that. This is called Play Rust, and they have just this online browser um, that you can go do it. So, so here's just a little taste of what Rust looks like. So if you want to determine whether or not something is prime, um, you have the variable name declaration on the right hand side, colon, and then the type on the, oops, sorry, name on the left, colon, and type on the right. Um, return statements, you don't actually have to say them, you can, but uh, Rust is all about everything being a statement, and so if you, in this case, um, just saying false here means that that is going to be the return value for it, so they, they kind of try to target brevity whenever possible. And then here's just a quick demonstration of the, the functional aspects of it. So this goes from 
you know, this calculates the square root, and then it goes from two to the max check value of it and checks and see if any of those values are, uh, <coughs> are divisible by, by the value previous to it. So this function will determine whether or not it's prime. Um, we got the number 113 on it. And if I run the assembly for it, you can kind of see the benefit of both Rust and the LLVM working together. Sorry, right around here. So, so what ends up happening is in the main function, uh, it ends up just loading up that value. It's already determined that it can compute that function and go through it without actually, um, you know, everything is constant, and so it's able to evaluate everything. And so that is prime function gets you know auto magic away by the compiler, and you end up just having true or false based off of based off of just the static analysis of the language. So, so you get you know, really, really fast stuff whenever the LLVM comes along to, to sweep things up for you. OK. Uh, so Rust is strongly statically typed. So they, you will not often see variable declarations because they try to prefer um, they try to prefer type inference whenever possible. However, you can't, uh, it, it won't auto course things for you. So, so Rust is very um, confident and it wants you to be very um, aware of what's going on whenever you try to take something and put it into another container. So it's, it's not trying to hide the details from you. So for example, if I tried to compile this thing, Rust comes in here and says, oh, we are not able to throw a u32, which is an unsigned 32-bit integer, into an i32 because these two things are not the same type. Um, and if you've ever done a C or C++ coding, you know that this can really bite you in some cases because you might be expecting like that you can you can throw these things around and the compiler doesn't actually catch you on that. It'll just kind of silently convert uh, unsigned integer into a signed integer without any notifications to you. <coughs> I am still winded. That's horrible. Um, as part of this strong static typing, it has generic support, and it had them kind of really early on in the language. So that's pretty nice. I mean, it will. So you can take like this add function, and you can define on the generics constraints for them. Um, so in this case, we're saying that we have a type of T and a type of U, and that U must implement the add functionality. And it must also be able to be converted from T. So in this case, I have add 1 and 255. And 255 is an unsigned 8-bit thing. And uh, 1 is a 32-bit thing. And this generic function here gets evaluated by the compiler generated. And then in this case, it ends up getting optimized away completely by the compiler because it knows all the type information at the beginning of it. Go back. Um, and finally, uh, Rust prefers immutability by default. So um, for example, in this case, it's actually a type level constraint. Um, whenever you say let something be something, uh, in Rust, that means that that variable is an immutable de declaration. If you wanted to actually mutate it, you have to uh, actually say mutable on the variable to make it changeable. So in this case, if I have A and then I try to reassign it, the compiler comes in and tells me that is not possible. Also tells me that it's unused. Um, but it, it goes deeper than that. The language actually makes guarantees to you that if you, if you have something that is mutable and then you turn it into an immutable and then you try to change the immutable thing from it. So in this case, we have baz that is a foo and we we let bar be a mutable, immutable reference to it. So we're saying, hey, I want to create a pointer that is immutable referencing that previous object. So I'm, I'm talking about that object here. Uh, at this point, if you tried to say, OK, now let's change the value. Even though this one is declared as being mutable, you've taken an Im immutable reference of it. And then Rust the language stops you from doing that. So and then another example of that happening. Also, it doesn't like unused variables. <laughs> so here, um, 
kind of leads into future slides, but this is the borrow checker telling me that, hey, you've taken a borrow of this thing, but then you tried to sign it later on, and that, that, doesn't, that doesn't fly with me. So. Um, functional, so uh, functions as data, you can go in and you can have a function that, that uh, takes values and, and defines it. Um, it's really nice because the language itself will go in and it will optimize away a lot of these stuff, this stuff. So like these lambdas that are included in this, uh, this code here ends up completely optimized away again by the compiler, um, just because it's able to understand and say, oh, you know, I know everything is constant here and I can optimize away all the calls that are associated with it. Um, yeah, so. So, I mean, it's really great as a language for its optimization support and, and what it can do for you. So you get a nice high-level language to deal with while having low-level performance constraints with it. Um, it is object-oriented. So uh, Rust has this concept of traits. And traits are, if you know Java, traits are just like interfaces in Java. And so you can go in and define a trait. So this is the awesome trait. And it is a function that returns whether or not something is awesome. Um, and then you can take that trait if you want to. And you can implement it on any sort of structure that exists in the language. So in this case, I'm saying I want awesome to be implemented for an integer. And I want to say if the integer is greater than 32, then it's awesome. And so in here, we now have extended our integer value um, well, so another example of generics here. So we're saying a generic of awesome and that is displayable, printed out if it's awesome. And then I just passed in an integer of 42 and comes out and tells me that 42 is awesome or true. Awesome is true for 42. So you, this is one of the other powerful points of the language is that the interfaces really aren't associated with the data that they're attached to, but rather that you can later define them. And so you can work with inter interfaces in your functions, but at the same time have the ability to apply them to your uh, structures and your data uh, later on as you need to. So it's kind of a nice feature I like. Um, and then the other part about it is really just that the structures and the interfaces are separated from each other. So um, in this case, you can define the data that is in the structure, but you're not necessarily defining what the uh, functionality is on top of that data. This becomes uh, really important when you're dealing with uh, especially low-level things, because uh, oftentimes in C or C++, you might have a struct or something like that that is doing operations. Um, and it's important to know exactly what the size of that struct is, because you might be writing it out to disk later on, or you might be, uh, I don't know, doing weird C and C++ things with it. Um, so Rust really kind of exposes that sort of functionality to you. And part of the reason it does that is because it is built to be interopt to interopt with C really well. Um, because they need to actually apply that when they're talking about integrating it with a browser like Firefox. OK, so that is the quick tour of the language. So let's talk about a little bit of the strengths of the language itself. So the primary strength and the reason why most people want to use Rust is safety. So uh, it allows you to have both memory safety and data race safety. So, uh, what does that mean? Uh, so for memory safety, it means that your memory won't leak, kind of. The, the problem is that, uh, you know, if you read this blog article here, it goes off and talks about it. But basically, leaking data doesn't actually cause problems with your structure. Rust doesn't usually leak memory. And it's, it's possible to do it, but it's not easy to do it. So and we'll ignore that that actually exists. But, um, but it also means that you don't run into problems like use after free, which is you know, a common bug that allows uh, attackers to go in and access data that they shouldn't have access to. Um, it doesn't have buffer overflow attacks. Again, another case where somebody could write too big of a mess memory or, or data that you're not expecting and then cause you to start executing data that, that you weren't expecting. Um, no double free, no null pointer dereferencing. All of this is prevented by the Rust borrow checker. So some quick examples of that. So this is the mutable example that I showed you earlier, basically. 
So if this were allowed to happen right here, where we say, oh, this y references x in here, and then x falls out of scope, well, that means that now the language has reclaimed that stack space, and now y might be pointing to something that doesn't actually exist anymore. And so that, you know, that's a tricky bug to solve, um, because you know, oftentimes that, that stack space and that memory reference right there will still contain the value of x. You just won't know. You know, it will only sometimes break, which is not great to get into. And so this is where the borrow checker is coming in and saying, oh, x doesn't live long enough. This x value has fallen off the stack, and now you're pointing into potentially dead memory space. Um, another example of where that can come into uh, play. So uh, you have a mutable x, and you have a y that references that, and then you add one to the y. Um, in Rust, it has a guarantee that you only ever have one, ref one mutable reference to a thing. And what that means is that if you have a, if you have a variable or some data, it means that you don't have pointer aliasing going on or anything like that. It means um, that you're, you're not able to, to share those variables across threads. And, and where that can come into play is like if you are talking about freeing up data or something like that, if you take a pointer and then you double it, and then something goes in and frees one side of that pointer, but the other side of the pointer is still being used, then it's pointing to dead memory at that point in time. And so that's a problem. And so they got around that by just saying, OK, we only allow one mutable reference and then an unlimited number of immutable references. We just say that the memory, and then the memory lives as long as those immutable references are alive. So it's kind of a cool thing. And then finally. And then finally, using those borrow checker rules, uh, you know, it, it, it can kind of, when you tar start talking about high, higher level abstractions, it can save you from running into problems. So, so in this case, let's imagine that you have a vector or a list of elements in it, and you want to iterate over them. But as you're iterating over them, you decide, oh, I'm going to push something to the end of that list. Well, Rust won't let you do that because you've said, oh, I have an immutable reference to that list. And you're trying to mutate that list. Um, so it prevents you from getting into the, you know, if you're in Java, the concurrent modification exception, you can't run into it because the language at the compiler level will actually prevent you from doing that. All right, go for it. Uh, what do you mean by that? Mm-hmm. So, so you can give a mutable reference. Oh, oh, sorry. So, uh, so the question was, can you pass that mutable reference uh, around? And the answer is yes. Um, but as soon as you give it up, uh, you you've lost that immu that mutable reference to use in your own code. So, so you can you can give somebody else the mutable reference. But then if later on in your code you said, okay, and then I'm going to change x, well, you can't do that because you handed it off to somebody else. So does that make sense? Um, and, and that just kind of, that ownership rule makes it so that you always know who is responsible for cleaning up or, or destroying the data or whatever. That's, that's the reason why they have that kind of a restriction down. Uh, other questions while we're here? No? OK. What? Yeah. OK. I'm just hearing myself in my microphone, so it's good. Um, so the other thing that it provides is kind of out of the box uh, is data race safety. So um, because Rust only allows the one mutable reference to things, well, if you remember your concurrency courses, that's actually the, the cause of data races is two mutable references to the same memory address. And so the guarantee at the language level actually blocks you from being able to have data races just generally. So it's really kind of a nice thing that falls out of the language. And it's one of those things that has helped them, the, rest, the uh, servo team, to build some pretty interesting data structures as a result of it. Because they don't have to worry about somebody potentially modifying data um, elsewhere in a thread. They, they already know that the compiler is guaranteeing to them that they're not doing, that, that somebody's not messing things up later on. OK, 
So another strength of the language is uh, just the tooling around it. So Rust, as it's grown up as a language, has been really kind of working hard about building, building tools and, and improving the actual ecosystem around it. So it has a package manager. Um, it has code linting. It has uh, a code formatting. So there's no more arguments about what the right way is, because the right way is the Rust way. Um, and then it also has code completion for IDE support. So, so if you have you know Emacs or Vim or or Visual Studio Code or anything like that, you can plug into the compiler itself and get type hints for you. So you can get nice things like auto completion. And also, a lot of people are excited about this, but it has official IntelliJ support. So there is actually a idea uh, plugin that is supported by the IntelliJ group people that. That's all the nice things with your with your IDD that you might want with Rust. Uh, documentation on Rust is really pretty awesome. So um, they work very hard to try to make Rust easy to come into because they know that it's annoying to come into. Um, the Rust programming language itself can kind of be uncomfortable when you're first starting out with it because there's a lot of rules that it, it, it enforces on you and prevents you from doing stuff. And so to kind of make that hurdle a little bit easier, they've written a ton of documentation to like get you up and going and, and go into really great detail about like, you know, references and borrowing or whatever whatever of these topics might interest you. So um, and then they have good API documentation, and then they even have like extended documentation on like the the dark arts of Rust and the dark corners of Rust if you're interested in that kind of stuff. Um, stability is part of the language guarantees now. So they, as I mentioned earlier, they guarantee that future languages or versions of Rust will be compatible with previous versions of Rust. So that's pretty nice. Um, they, they have a, a tool called Crater. And basically, because they built the package management ecosystem into Rust, it means that they're able to go in and get a very large swath of the Rust ecosystem and see if a proposed compiler release is going to break with it. And so they'll, they'll actually go out and compile a ton of packages on the uh, Cargo ecosystem and see if there's any differences in breaking changes as a result of moving forward with it. And so that, that makes it so that you can be pretty confident that the compiler itself is relatively stable and it's not going to break in the future or break your code in the future. Um, but further, they've also adopted the, uh, the nightly beta and stable release pattern of the browser. So that means that they will put features out onto nightly. After six weeks, it moves into beta. And after six weeks, that moves into stable. And they've done that so that people can test the compiler at various stages and be able to know, you know, OK, you know, this change that's in nightly, if it makes its way down into stable, it's going to break my application. So let's you know, file an issue with the Rust team and have them correct it before it actually gets to the stable release. So lots of nice features there to, to keep the, the language moving fast. Um, uh, because the language actually evolves really quickly. Um, it has an open RFC process, which means that anybody anywhere can actually go in and make a proposal for a change to the language. And the team will go through and uh, decide on whether or not that change is valid. So you can, this is just an example of one uh, feature that came into Rust. Uh, one of the guys came in and said, hey, you know, uh, what I really need is unions. So um, when you're talking about C code, oftentimes you have these structures that have multiple data points inside of them. But uh, you need to treat it differently depending on some flag at the beginning of that structure. And so if you're talking to a C library, it can be really inconvenient if you don't have that memory layout control on it. So. The guy that wrote this, he was just working with embedded systems, and he wanted Rust to work with the embedded systems libraries. Um, but this was a pain point for him. And so he came in, he made the proposal for unions, and worked with the Rust compiler team. And now it's an accepted RFC that made it way all the way to the language and then changing the language. <coughs> um, so they're able to move pretty quickly there, and they're able to adopt a lot of new language features. But then the stability guarantees and tests further up the stream means that they, you know you're not going to actually be broken when Rust comes along. 
So uh, what is Rust actually good for? Um, something, for sure. Um, browsers. So this was, I mean, this really was the bread and butter of why Rust. They, they, they really wanted to be able to do things faster with browsers. Um, so they, they have already begun the process of integrating uh, portions of Servo back into Firefox, which has already led to some pretty impressive performance increases in the Firefox web browser. Um, web servers. So Rust actually would make, it's not quite there yet, but it's getting there. It, it makes a pretty good language for uh, web servers and web server-like environments. Now, because the language is strongly statically typed, and I didn't really cover this, but uh, it also supports macros, which language extensions. It means that you can go in and you can define custom extensions to the language that the compiler will still guarantee that your type system is uh, validating for you. So in this case, uh, this Rocket project, you can go in and define your endpoint, define these git values on it, and Rocket will complain to you if name is undefined as a parameter inside of your git request. So, you know, uh, pretty nice features that come out of the language just as, just as a general thing, and it's an evolving ecosystem there. Uh, package management servers. So funnily enough, not Cargo, NPM is actively adopting Rust in many of their portions of uh, their ecosystem. And the reason they're doing this is because they, you know, they need a fast language and they need to be able to uh, expand their language and, and, and expand their, their servers on the back end and they need, a, need something that has low overhead in order to do that. So Rust has been something that they have been slowly integrating into the back end of NPM. Um, and really just anywhere. So uh, Rust is a, is a pretty young and it's a pretty powerful language. It's, it's built really to be anywhere that you would want it to be. And because of its uh, type safety guarantees, it means that you can really kind of use it in any sort of ecosystem that, that, uh, that would require safety or correctness of code um, as a guaranteed for it. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's not a perfect language, but it's getting there. So, questions? Go for it. I mentioned about this object oriented. One thing I hate about uh, C is something called class slicing. Uh -huh. um, uh, does Rust, um, you know, not, does Rust you know, check against that or does it not have that issue? I'm not familiar with the problem. So basically, when you have an interface um, and you have some methods defined as an interface, and then you saying, like, that it, like, interface whatever equals this object, and that object has more methods than that. Mm -hmm. um, if you try using that um, object that you said equal to, mm -hmm. you only have access to the methods defined in the interface. Oh, uh, so yes, it does that because um, when you when you pass so if you pass in a structure and it's the structure itself uh, that you give up, then oh, sorry, to let me let me go back and actually explain the question to make sure that I got it right. So the problem is that you have a method; it takes an interface. Um, and then in C++, you only end up having access to the methods on that interface, right? And you lose all the data associated with the other things not in that interface. Right, so you, so you lose the data points that are not associated with the, the interface. Okay, so, so in Rust, you don't, so you only ever talk about either the interfaces or the data inside of Rust. So, so if you give something a structure uh, that has the data inside of it, you have access to all the, the data in it. Or if your method is using like generics or so, and it takes in interfaces, then you only ever have access to those interfaces that you've defined on that generic method. So probably has the same problem, but I don't know. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah, any other questions? Go for it. So uh, the STL in C++ is kind of train wreck. Right. Uh, does Rust either use uh, structures in Rust? I saw a vector there. It looked pretty simple. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> right. So uh, the question is, is the STL in C++ is a wreck? Uh, is the Rust standard libraries not a wreck? Um, I would say. Yes, from what I've used, like they they very much adopt a pretty similar pattern to what uh, what Java has done with like the streams and such. And so you get 
you have an iterable and you can extend it and you can do mapping and filtering and flat mapping or whatever against that iterable interface. Um, so, and, and then they have a lot of basic features, but they don't have quite the, uh, the operational crust of C++. So they don't have a lot of like the weird uh, begin and end. And, and then the other thing that happens is that uh, Rust really kind of has a good, uh, uh, it, the type inference actually helps you quite a bit in Rust. And so, because the language is already sniffing types for you and such, and it's, it's really pretty smart. Like it actually will often only determine the type until, you know, once it's gotten to a point where the type has been constrained inside of your function block. So like you can go pretty, pretty far with it without actually typing any sort of type information, if that makes sense. Um, but, but yeah, the, it's an expansive library that has a lot of, uh, a lot of cool features inside of it. Um, that, yeah, I, I mean, I, I can't tell you if it's as much a train wreck or not. I don't have enough experience with the STL to say how much of a train wreck Rust is, comparatively speaking. But does that help? Uh, yeah. Okay. Other questions? Go for it. Uh, so it is, so is the Rust compiler slower than uh, the C compiler? So interestingly enough, it is almost the same, like it's not quite as fast as the C compiler, primarily because it's doing uh, link time optimizations whenever you compile anything. And so it's as slow as a C compiler that also is doing link time optimizations which can be pretty slow. I mean, that's not, that's not quick. Um, they're actively working on improving that, uh, that portion of it. But, but as, I, as far as I understand from following the Rust community, one of their big slowdowns really is that last LLVM step that C++ goes, or you know, the C compilers that use LLVM <laughs> go through. So go for it. So uh, legacy C code rewriting in Rust, does it make sense to do that, right? Okay, so basically uh, they try to advocate against doing that generally just as a Rust community because it gets annoying whenever somebody says, oh, I have this security issue and somebody from Rust community comes out and says, uh, rewrite it in Rust and it's gone. Um, it doesn't necessarily always make sense. So like. Um, for example, games is, is a good example of where Rust might not make sense to start rewriting things in because there's not really a whole lot of security concerns going on when you have a game depending on what it's doing, you know, because oftentimes it's just server talking to the game and there's no potential for exploitation in it. Um, however, browsers or databases or things that, you know, are taking user input from all sorts of sources, um, those are places that we'll see benefits from bringing Rust into their ecosystem and slowly transitioning over into a Rust sort of environment. Um, so sometimes it depends. Other questions? Go for it. It does not. So uh, you can, so the question is how do well does Rust handle dynamic data or dynamic data types, right? Um, so it will, you have maps in Rust, for example, and you can do things with maps and dictionaries and such, um, and you can store the data as such. And you can also define your structures and store the data in those structures. But one of the powerful points of Rust is the fact that it is all about uh, managing your memory yourself and knowing what's going on with your memory. And so you're not going to be able to say, oh, you know, this JSON blob coming in, I need 500 kilobytes of memory in order to shove it into, you know, you can't really do that because you don't know whether or not you're going to do that um, without actually parsing the JSON. So uh, it has libraries for serializing and deserializing JSON. What it doesn't really have is uh, is the ability to have dynamic data structures or data structures that are changed on uh, runtime. You can do it with maps, but, but not really at the language level. And we're at time. So 
um, come talk to me. I'm Thomas May. Um, if you have any other questions, I'm available. So.